Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Yakima, Washington's spookiest town in the U.S., has mysterious Indian rock paintings, older than the native Yakima tribes. Nobody knows who made them. Kenneth Arnold landed at the Yakima airport after his famous sighting of UFOs over Mount Rainier, which coined the term flying saucers. Patterson and Gimlin of Bigfoot fame were both from Yakima and that's also where they purchased the camera which captured their famous footage. The town is a UFO hotspot famous for the Yakima lights investigated by J. Allen Hynek in the 70s. The alleged location of Mel's Hole is about an hour's drive from town. I've lived in Washington all my life, but have only spent a week or so in Yakima. Can't tell you much else about Yakima, but I can tell you a bit about the general area. I'm not sure where it is, but I think somewhere along the Columbia River, which doesn't flow far from Yakima, they've found pictographs of Sasquatch. When Lewis and Clark came through the area they recognized them as depictions of great apes. They were a bit confused since they hadn't encountered any apes on their journey and no one had discovered any in North America, so they asked the natives how they knew of their existence. The natives replied, because we have seen them. Within an hour or so of Yakima are the Tri-Cities, Pasco, Kenwick, and Richland. The cities grew up as a result of housing needed for the nearby Hanford base. Hanford is where they developed the first atomic bomb. These days it's a major radioactive waste dump and there are concerns it's been poisoning the Columbia and the Tri-Cities. Some distance south of Yakima, along the Columbia River, a Quaker by the name of Sam Hill tried to set up a town called Mary Hill, named after his wife that was supposed to be a thriving community in the middle of the desert. In the center of town he built a full-scale replica of Stonehenge as a monument to the soldiers of World War I. He had heard the original Stonehenge was meant to be a sacrificial altar so he built it as a reminder that the soldiers were all sacrificed for the cause of war. The town ended up burning down a while later, though. Basically all that remains is Stonehenge and a nearby museum. That's about all I know about the area that's remotely X related. Aside from that, I can tell you Yakima is the center of Washington's apple industry, which means migrant workers. There's a very healthy Mexican population in the area. At any rate, us Washingtonians, and our brothers in Oregon, tend to like acting eccentric and enjoy messing with the normals which is probably why shows like Gravity Falls and Twin Peaks get set here. My wife once told me a story from when she was a teenager. They were living in Salah at the time and her dad was considering moving the family to Spokane due to a better job offer. They were looking at houses around the area during the winter and so they had to deal with snow. They had a broker that was taking them to different locations. They had arrived in an old mining town outside of Spokane, she can't remember the name of it, but basically she describes it as a cluster of trailer houses and an old grange. In particular they were looking the big old grange and considering converting into a home. My wife says it would have been the biggest house they have lived in if they ever got it. They had been exploring the premises when they got down to inspecting the basement. The agent was showing them around the basement when they heard a noise coming from upstairs. She says it sounded like someone was banging violently or jumping on the floor, and that it was loud enough to scare the shit out of everyone there including the broker. They thought that someone was in the grange with them. Everyone went upstairs to check it out but they found nothing. Whether her dad truly believed it or not, her tried to shrug it off as the snow shuffling off the roof. Broker was not really keen on staying there much longer. Wife says that as they left, she didn't see any snow on the roof that looked like it came off. Seattle has a very unsettling aura to it. Depressing weather creates a spooky coloration to the state, the poverty and filth, the famous serial killers, 
the vast and terrible wilderness, the tech companies. I don't like it there. Whenever I visit I'm a little unsettled. I have a friend who lives near this very strange Buddhist temple in the middle of a suburb. It's completely walled off, about the size of a block and you can sort of see inside from a road above it. It's a few buildings, with paths between. It seems deserted at all hours of the day, and you never see monks walking around or even hippie types. Outside it, on the road, there's always a few abandoned cars filled with varying amounts of garbage. That was the first thing that made me really wonder about this place. One night, I was drunk and feeling ballsy and decided to walk down to the temple at night. It was probably about 2 a.m. Going alone, I smoked a cigarette and walked up to the main gate of the thing. I had no intention towards anything other than observation. Suddenly, from behind the gate to the temple a dog began furiously barking, having detected my presence. I didn't see it because I ran off immediately. It scared the shit out of me, and it did not stop barking for probably five plus minutes after I left. I figured it must have been trained as a guard dog. I felt that was a little strange for a Buddhist temple, but the area was a little rough so who knows. Anyway, I had another cigarette while trying to calm myself on the front porch of the house after I ran back. I had never had the feeling before, and I thought it was exaggeration, but I had the distinct feeling that someone was watching me from the small forested area near the house, across the road, between me and the temple. That's all there is to the story. I should try to find out more about the temple. It's one of the few times I've been genuinely unsettled by a building, and maybe not in what it had, but what it lacked. Lived here most of my life, Lakewood and Tacoma are two of the spookier places. I've lived in more dangerous areas but I just feel considerable discomfort in these places. The place I currently live is very, very haunted in the sense that many people have killed themselves, and several people have been killed inside. Might dox me but it's been section 8 since the 70s and got renovations 10 years ago. Before then it was a public hazard dropping bricks on cars and was getting swatted or lit on fire every month. I am an introvert, and literal oddest among other things and I've never felt a place with such a dreadful aura. It could be all those who died, but I am convinced that it is also all those who live, drug addicts, crazies, all number of hopeless soul who'd been consumed by this place. It is like a purgatory where some crack fiend will try to kick in your door at 2 am and threaten to stab you while screeching mad gibberish, true story. This place has a way of eating at the soul and the sanity that is difficult to describe. I can feel it in the air, probably crack in the air who knows, but I have a handful of experiences if this thread doesn't die before I can get to them. Since moving here I've developed an uncanny sense for where and when shit is about to go down. Times where I knew not to take out my garbage when someone would get stabbed to death, not even a few meters from where I take out my garbage, or not going to a certain gas station before someone gets killed over a crack lighter, etc. But the peculiar thing is that others have this sense as well. My old neighbor had a drug problem. He'd run rampant up and down the halls, threatening to kill people with his small dick out, throwing crack at my door, fucking weird dude. But the strangest fucking thing was that he would emulate me from behind the door. There was no way he could have known what I was doing inside, but he always seemed to know and to loudly mock what I was doing. If I was holding a knife he'd call it out, if I was doing something on my computer he'd call it out. It was like he had a camera in my room or a sixth sense. He eventually got kicked out onto the street after several years of destroying property. A few months after this I'd always catch this dude stalking me, watching. Just always in some corner of where I intended to be. One day as I used my keycard to get back into the building after a long and arduous outing I caught a glimpse of him. You gonna call the police? And I came home to that all too familiar sweet burnt plastic smell. Someone had an interesting time here, 
Several things were out of place but strangely nothing was stolen. Someone smoked a magic fucking rock in here and I have no clue as to how. I don't know what was up with that fucker, he had a strange aura about him, like the former glowy kind. He always had a weird grasp on what I was thinking and when I was thinking it. And in my meditations, I find that I have developed an enhanced sense for this as well simply by being in proximity of whatever unfathomable cocktail of illicit substances are in the air, not having smoked them of course. TL. DR crack might give you superpowers. So I am native to the Pacific Northwest and have lived in Washington my whole life. Lived in Seattle, Sammamish, and Bellingham mostly. Over years of being immersed in the occult, constantly seeking, and being pretty well connected here, I've picked up a lot of interesting insights into the area. From deep Inuwoods to the corruption of the city. Can definitely share more of what I know later if anyone is interested. Anyways, I actually have a ton of strange stories and can do more green text later, too, if you want, but I'll start with this one crazy experience I had with vampires, apologies as I don't often type this much. Be me, 16 or 17 high school. Used to party all of the time. Me and my friends were wild in high school. Always looking for parties to go to. Couldn't find anything happening Friday night. Hanging with some guys and girls. Decide to go into the city and go to the university. Hoping maybe to crash a frat party. Drive around campus and fuck around a bit. Asking people if we can come party at their frats. Of course everyone says no, we are dumb high schoolers. Finally some much older dude walks by, early 30s. We ask him if we can go to his party. He seems totally down and says sure, follow me. Okay, sweet fuck yes jpg. Tell him we'll give him a ride. He hops in our car and his spot is only like a block or two away. This is Greek row in Seattle so it's all big old mansions. Get out of the car and he leads us to this big gated mansion, super nice. Not atypical though, tons of frats here, but this is not as trashed. He leads us through the gate and up inside the house or whatever. Full of people, pretty wide variety of people, sorta youngish looking in their early 30s, but not college aged. Older than college age but still seem pretty cool. Diverse group of people, some black guy with dreads. Seem to be having a good time, not raging or anything, just drinking and maybe railing something in the corner idk. The one thing everyone did have in common. Everyone had huge fangs. Fangs like you'd imagine a vampire's, for canines. Like really good real looking fangs. My face when. Be just a teenager, kinda thinking WTF. Like a couple dozen people chilling, drinking, all with fangs. Random dude comes up to me and says. Oh, are you here for the vampire party too? Smiles at me all friendly. Nope.jpg. Gather all of my friends and we nope the fuck out of there so fast. Went and found a different party and got super fucked up, never really dwelt much on it as friends. Coulda just been LARPers with really good prosthetic fangs or whatever, but they would have been expensive lol. They were legit looking, like I said. I wouldn't put it past a bunch of cetolites to LARP as vampires, there's plenty of people into the occult and that cringy, but who knows. I sure as hell don't want to know LMAO. Anyways, I always wondered how they had one of the nicest mansions in the city if they weren't a frat. Funny ass experience looking back. It wasn't particularly scary then, but I wouldn't ever have wanted to stick around. It was really weird vibes. Be me, sophomore in high school, at a basketball game, get invited to a bonfire. Parents are in Seattle, visiting mom's cousin in the hospital. Staying with uncle overnight in the meantime. Call and ask if I can go. Knows how much of a beta the first am so he says I should. Bonfire is at some native kid's village. We arrived, about 14 of us in all. Play soccer, chill, tell stories. 
Native Kid tells the story of a burial ground by the sand dunes, only a short distance of where we were. A while later we all go home. As we enter the highway, the friend who was driving makes a sharp left and stops at the foot of the sand dunes. Tells us he wants to check out the burial ground really fast. Like the idiots we are we decide to keep going and see this thing for ourselves. Now we're at the foot of the mountain, and we just passed the dunes. After driving up a little more up the mountain we see a few small stone monuments and feather necklaces, drums, etc. stuff the natives leave for the dead. Nothing scary, but we see a large cat staring at us about 40 feet away. It runs away back up the mountain, redneck friend decides to chase it. We follow and see him holding the cat, standing at the entrance of a small cave. Redneck realizes what he was holding the entire time. It was a mountain lion cub, and he thought it was a large house cat that was somehow lost in the mountains. He dropped it and we kind of panicked for a second, because the cave, more of a small hollow carved into the mountain, had some bones in it, and we realized that was the mountain lion's home, and the mom was obviously close by. We ran back to the car after hearing some growls and on the way there one of us knocked over a pile of stones, since we decided to go through the cemetery instead of around it. After we drove back down the mountain and got home, we went back to a gas station in a town close to the mountain. We were all shaken a bit and we kind of just sat in the car for a while. Driver friend gets up and says he needs to use the restroom and walks into the gas station. Redneck friend notices something along the road by the river. I see some weird stick thing that looks like a short wooden post, but it's swaying a little. Then it turned around and started walking. It looked just like a tiny person. Not a midget, but it looked exactly like a man was shrunk down to about two feet, wearing a loincloth and some moccasins. It just sort of sprinted toward us and ran under our car. Redneck friend immediately got out and looked under, yelling at it and telling it to go away. And it wasn't there, it just disappeared. Driver friend comes out and we tell him about it, of course he thinks it's BS. On the way back home we keep seeing more of these little people by the side of the road, and so does my driver friend. He starts driving faster when they start sprinting towards us. And we're the only people on the highway. No trucks, no cars, nothing. Even at 11.30ish there's always a ton of vehicles on this part of the road. By now we must have passed hundreds of these little people. We would outrun them since we had a car, but every minute more would start chasing us. When we got back to town we all scattered, except for my driver friend, who drove home. I ran a few blocks until I reached my uncle's house and ran into my room. For the rest of the night I kept hearing gravel crunching and the fence kept shaking violently, and yet when I would look out the window I saw nothing. In the morning I was on my way to school and saw little black footprints on the driveway. I asked the native friend if he knew anything about little people, once I got to school. He said he only knew the caused mischief, but a girl from the Yakima tribe who sits nearby said they were revenge spirits instead and you can't chase them or look for them, or else they disappear. And you never know where they show up next. I have a decent bat squatch story. I saw it in ape caves near Mount St. Helens, Seattle friend here. I was hiking with two friends, my girlfriend, and her friend. Me, also being a commando, had my Kimber 1911 in .45 on me. Me and one of my friends are former Boy Scouts, so we knew how to prepare for shit. Ape Caves is an eight-mile-long stretch of giant-ass caves. We all had headlamps and flashlights, my girl had my lantern. We were probably around two miles in, when we hear several loud, inhuman screeches. The cave is pretty fucking cold year-round. And this was in the middle of January, so it was pretty damn cold. We had the whole place to ourselves. Whatever made that sound, wasn't another human. We were all scared shitless. We all had our knives out, I held back on pulling my gun, 
because I wasn't entirely sure if we were about to get brutally murdered or not. Then my friend pointed out something moving on top of the cave. It was just hanging there like a cocoon. I saw to red, piercing eyes glowing from our lights. It spread its wings and violently flapped down in front of us. Then we fucking panicked. Everyone but me ran away screaming, tripping and falling at some point, all while I screamed a variety of curse words trying to draw my pistol. The thing lunged towards me right as I opened fire. Only two of the four rounds I fired hit, because I was in straight up panic mode. I ducked, it went right over me and kept going. I fell down backwards and tried to hit it more, but it pulled up too quickly for me to shoot. It looked pretty injured, though. I hurried to catch up with the rest of the group, and picked a few of their dropped knives along the way. I saw my girlfriend's lantern up ahead all shattered, I thought she fell. I got a closer look, ready to pick her up or do whatever I had to, but she wasn't there. I collapsed and started losing my shit. I had my gun out, calling her name, but got no response. Just that same terrifying screech. I was sitting there alone, listening and wondering what the fuck to do. I wasn't sure if my friends got out alive or not. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to find out. I was almost ready to take my own life, when I realized that no matter what happened, I wasn't gonna let myself die in there. At this point, it was a battle. If anyone's getting out, it's gonna be me. I probably shouldn't have stuck around, because it came after me again. This time, it came from the side. It tried to land a few feet in front of me, but I emptied the three rounds in my mag on it. This time, all three hit. It was knocked to the ground, squirming and squealing. I was too shaken up to do anything, but it managed to fly back upwards. In a few minutes, I decided to pop in my only spare mag and keep moving, this time more cautiously. I wanted to shout for my friends, but I didn't think it'd be a good idea. I kept thinking and heard them, but I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I knew that the screeching was sounding more painful each minute, I hoped I killed it. The tunnel started to get a little bit warmer and a little brighter, because I was almost at the end of the cave. I heard my friend call my name, and I managed to call his back. I was home free at that point, I got up there and they were mostly okay. One friend broke his hand, and my girl's friend got a minor concussion. Other than that, just a few scrapes and bruises. They said they heard my gunshots and didn't think I made it. We got the injured people to Harbor View, ASAP. Afterwards, we debated whether or not to tell how it all happened. I didn't want to end up in a madhouse. We weren't sure if I killed it, but we didn't want to go back and find out. This place is still somehow a tourist attraction. I never heard anything about a giant man-bat hybrid. I heard rumors that people have seen glowing eyes in there, though. Like I said, spend a summer into fall, backpacking from Washington through Oregon. I'd walk through the woods and trails close to the highway, hitchhike when I got close to the town, get any needed supplies, and head off again. Even bought one of those weirdo collapsible bikes because why not? Start my journey, walking through the trails and shit. See other campers and some locals on hikes, some give me up and down looks but I figured I should get used to it. Nighttime comes, need to set up camp. See a what looks like a party up the trail, I'm cautious, but it was also at a trucker stop so I was stranded. Group of about six hobos and a few other campers having a fire. They welcome me, apparently this is the norm for them. Night goes on it's just me and two others awake, talking well into the night. I ask about how long they've done this and for some stories, they're older guys, and have been on the road for years so I'm interested. They tell me off all the funny pranks and shit they've pulled and can get away with cause we're fucking vagrants, we're goddamn ghosts. It goes from simple shoplifting and dine and dashes to worse stuff. Robberies, breaking into homes, one guy says how he's been with the women of these homes, which I'm pretty sure meant assault. I'm keeping my best poker face while death gripping the knife in my pocket. Even make up stories of how I used to knock off stores and was part of a stick up. They go to bed, I sneak off an hour later in the dark. 
The first time the reality hit me of what I was doing, definitely a wake-up call to the potential dangers. Greetings, Anons. Been listening to too many slash x slash tales on YouTube and decided to share my personal Innerwood stories from my hometown. Haven't been on 4CHAN in about 12 or 13 years, so bear with me as I try to green text this story. Be me. Around spring of 1994. Live in the town of Ashford, about 7 miles outside the park entrance to Montana Rainier National Park in Washington State. Woods are full of abandoned, overgrown logging roads from the 40s to the 60s and so on. Prime for exploring in a woods. Dad decides to explore the woods above our house. Traverse the wilderness until we stumble across one of these old logging roads. Follow it for a ways, then we veered off and climb up a steep, wooded hill. Reach the crest and look down to see what looks like a greenhouse or small shack with four rows of pot plants out front. Oh yeah dot jiff. Don't smoke and look sketchy, so I decided to nope out of there and back on home. Go to school next day and tell classmates about the discovery. Gonna score some popularity points hooking everyone up with free weed. That weekend, assemble a force of five teenagers to go and raid this illegal grow. Was pre-slash-K slash Amando era, so all we had were some BB guns and a baseball bat with big nails driven through it like an overgrown trench mace. WW1Stormtroopers.jpg Set out in a woods. Listening to O.J. Simpson trial on Walkman cause that was the big thing at the time. Make our way through the woods and onto the abandoned logging road. Wondering amongst ourselves if Shaq belongs to some kind of hermit or mountain man too dumb or naive to think illegal grow operations are dangerous. Hear various noises off in the brush but figure it's just a deer or some shit. Half hour into our hike and something seems off. Get the feeling we are being watched. My fellow Anans and I start to get spooked. Hear strange knocks on tree in the distance. Decide to push on anyway, cause free weed. About 500 yard up the road, a freaking rock comes sailing through the woods and impacts in the nearby brush. What the fuck dot BPM? We all stop our stare at each other dumbfounded. Figure the hermit or mountain man must have spotted us. Roar. Oh shit that's Bigfoot. PSP. Couldn't see the thing, but it roared like a fucking dragon out of some medieval fantasy movie. Seen those Bigfoot hunter shows on TV later and made exact same noise you hear on there. Tactically shit ourselves and bolt as fast as we can in the other direction. Can still hear movement stomping through the brush in the distance behind us as we run for our lives. Escape from the woods, terrified but alive. Moral of the story. Don't try and steal weed guarded by a Sasquatch. But this was not my last encounter with the legendary beast. Second story coming up. Time for my next encounter with the Pacific Northwest's legendary cryptid. Be me. Around October 2002. In my room playing Vidya, jamming out with clan mates on SACOM, US Navy SEALs on the PS2. Around 11 o'clock at night. Hear lots of commotion outside. Horses are going absolutely apeshit out in the corral running around in a panic. Go out to see what the hell is going on. Figure might be a mountain lion or bear nearby. Horses continue to freak out. One busts straight through a barbed wire fence, cutting their chest wide open to escape whatever the heck is out there. Danger will Robinson dot wave. Go wake up parents. They get dressed and go out to investigate. Near noises from the hillside above our house. Definitely something up there. Parents grab old Colt New Frontier .22 revolver and head towards the base of the hill. Something huge is stomping through the fallen leaves, pushing over trees. Suggest shooting a few rounds into the darkness to scare whatever it is off. Roar. Oh shit it's Bigfoot again. Panic. Same dragon-like roar from all the Bigfoot TV shows. Off in the distance, hear a fainter roar coming from further back in the hills. Oh shit, there's more of them. Thing stomps off through the brush without further incident. Horses eventually quiet down and things go back to normal. Later shoot an email to BFRO, the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization recounting the events. Investigator from Western Washington calls me back within a few days and says Ashford is a hotbed of Bigfoot activity and thinks there's a community of at least 20 to 30 of the creatures in the area. 
says they don't post many of the reports they receive on their website about them in order to protect the creatures. Have heard reports of other sightings from locals in the area having encountered the creatures on local logging roads or finding footprints. Got one in a wood story. I've posted it here before but whatever. Summer after junior high graduation. BFF and I are in Washington state visiting her dad. Dad's house is quite literally in the middle of the woods, on a mountain no less. Dad and Dad's GF work the graveyard shift at the local hospital, so BFF, and I have this nice house to ourselves most of the time. One night we're just chillin' and playin' rock band. Dog a cute mix, needs to go potty. No real backyard since the house sits on a cliff overlooking a river, so we take the dog out to the front and link her to her tether. Standing on front porch, shooting the shit, and making sure dog does her business. It's like 2 a.m. and the night is super still. The house is surrounded by these super black woods. Dog suddenly gets very tense. She is staring directly into the woods, not making a sound. BFF and I get worried, thinking that there might be coyotes lurking around planning an attack on the poor dog. Out of the fucking blue, these huge crashing sounds break the silence of the night. It sounds like something enormous is crashing through the trees and knocking them down. There are no sounds of machinery or wind beneath the stomping. BFF and I freak and book it into the house, temporarily forgetting the dog outside. Shit we forgot the fucking dog. Go outside again, dog is on the steps of the porch, straining forcefully against the tether. She is barking and crying. Let her in, we all sit by the door with stupid improvised weapons in our hands. Dad and his GF come home, tell Dad what happened. He says, oh it was probably just the neighbors. To this day, I still will not believe it was the neighbors. It was a pretty spooky experience. The next day I did some investigating around the trees. It was like nothing had ever happened. BFF also went back to that house the following summer for another visit, and heard huge shit walking around on the roof at night. Something must be up with Washington. I'm sorry I didn't pre-type this I don't really feel like I have the time and I'm on the verge of a panic attack so I figured I would get this off my chest as soon as possible so at least that way my side of the story gets out. My parents, now deceased, owned a cabin out on Lake Stickney, Washington. A wooden one. Nothing fancy and it had a small wooden dock that my dad used to tether his boat to when he actually had it. I of course visited my parents when they were home at their condo but Lake Stickney was a fair drive away so I never ended up visiting the cabin on vacation or anything of that sort. My dad died of cancer about a year ago and my mom just recently passed from what the doctors claimed to be influenza but the symptoms never really matched. She would constantly get new bruises on different parts of her body and about once a day she would get a bloody nose, but a really blood nose. However the majority of her other symptoms matched it so I guess it's just the most probable guess. For the first time in my life, I had to drive down to Lake Stickney to pick up my parents' stuff because the property owner wanted to resell the land as soon as possible. My parents had only ever had one neighbor while they owned the cabin, and as I pulled up the driveway I saw him sitting on his front porch with a cup of iced tea in one hand and a newspaper in the other. I nodded at him and threw a hand up, he didn't return it. As a matter of fact, as soon as I got out of my car he stood up and walked back inside. I didn't pay him much attention and instead undid the bike chain over the double set of doors. They claim their lock broke years ago but dad was always too cheap to replace it, and walked inside. Oddly I found myself stopping in the doorway. There was a heavy musk in the air and the way the sunlight filtered through the window illuminated the dust particles in the air creating an ancient feeling to the place that had only been empty for a few days. I of course explored around, 
found a lot of antique cups and pebbles that my mom collected off the waterfront over the years. I never really truly admired how expensive the place must have been until that moment. My dad constantly went on about how he wanted to sell it but never did. He claimed cleaning the house would be too much of a stress on his bones. As I explored I found myself on the back porch which was completely empty except for a door on the far left side which was likely a small closet. It had a padlock on it which looked rusted to all hell. I pulled out my mom's keychain and tried each one individually but none of them fit the lock. So, logically it was my dad that probably locked this door up. My dad kept most of his gardening stuff under his porch so I just went under and grabbed his branch trimmers and worked the lock until eventually it popped off. The inside of it was much more spacious than the small door on the outside and the relatively thin wall of the cabin suggested, about the size of a small bedroom. However nothing could have fucking prepared me for the stench. It smelled quite literally like shit that was mixed with rotting fish that was also mixed with vomit and superheated um. It was so horrible I immediately reached for the light switch out of reflex only to find that it doesn't work. I slammed that door shut to escape the stench and kind of hurriedly walked, ran back inside to grab a flashlight I spotted earlier. When I went back, I opened the door and flicked on the flashlight to see some horror movie level disturbing shit. It was completely barren except for a shovel leaning against the corner and a broken, thick glass jar with shards laying all around it on the floor. A black rotting liquid lay on the floor that was surrounded and filled with all matter of dead insects. I can only imagine that's where the stench came from. I grabbed the shovel and prodded at the puddle. Discovering that the entire top surface has caked over and dried, and as the shovel broke the hardened surface a whole new kind of fucking smell emerged. It was almost like it increased exponentially. I actually think for a second I went nose blind. It stung to inhale even through my mouth. I went around with the shovel and knocked on the bottom right corner of the shed to discover that the bottom right corner of the back wall had a slide-down paneling that sheltered a vent. The bottom pane of the vent was stuffed with paper towels that looked like they had yellowed with age and soaked up some sort of leakage. As I prodded around the room suddenly got colder. I'm aware this was likely all in my head but could have sworn I felt like something was looking over my shoulder. None of this added up. My mom was a clean freak. And my dad literally kept nothing from me. There's no reason he wouldn't clean up a spill if it wasn't something more, and he wouldn't have locked it up without telling my mom unless he had something to hide and my mom wouldn't have ignored the lock unless she suspected it was something she really didn't want to see. I was fixing to leave as it got to the point where I had to hold my shirt up to my face just to breathe somewhat normally. I turned to walk up but I heard something. You guys know that effect where you hear something that sticks with you so much that you can still hear it perfectly vivid even days after you heard it. Well, as I was stepping through the doorway I heard a little scratch coming from behind me. It was small, and it sounded like something scratching on the metal of the vent, almost as if it were lower than I was. Meaning that at some point the vent turned downward. So I need someone to argue my logic here. If there is a vent that is connected to a top shed, that has an opening, wouldn't it be logical to assume that there is another opening to the vent? Obviously somewhere underground? My dad obviously knew about it, and the thought that my dad knew about some underground room and wanted to hide it from both me and my mother was almost too much to fucking bear. Also something was fucking scratching down there meaning that something with really sharp claws and was heavy enough to be heard was directly under me. I freaked the fuck out. 
No way that could have been a rat or insect otherwise I wouldn't have even heard it move. I turned right on my heels and fucked right out of that place. I walked back out to my car and noticed my neighbor's car was gone but I never heard it drive off. So that's my story, X. I haven't gone back and I don't think I will any time too. It's a far drive and I'm kind of a pussy. But I'm curious as to what you guys think. I grew up in Yakima, and the only place where shit ever got weird was out on the res. Indian burial grounds, abandoned homesteads with horse and owl corpses dumped next to them, possible serial killers that never get identified, much less caught. Do you know anything about Tampico? I lived there for a year weird shit went down. Also, possible serial killers. I'd like explanation, I was followed home once by a car with three men, I got a pretty good lead on them at one point and managed to keep it till I got home, upon arriving home I scrambled to the nearest firearm. By the time I got outside the car had pulled up and the people inside were getting out a little farther down the road. I fired three warning shots and they dipped. I've been out to Tampico. One of my buddies used to be involved with the old mission down Othenham Road. If you get out there you start getting into, woods people, rednecks and tweakers, so that doesn't surprise me. I'd be packing all the time if I lived out there lol they coulda been tweakers? Although a bunch of my friends claimed that like a decade ago the cops found an old woman with her face blown off up near Tyaton. It's way north of Tampico, but it's about the same distance west from Yakima. And for the serial killer thing, when I worked at the Herald my editor told me about a string of bodies turning up on the res a couple decades ago, but since it's tribal police they either didn't or chose not to investigate it so they never found out if they were related. Res cops are weird, they don't have to talk with anyone if they don't want. Some guy shot up one of their tribal buildings one time, and the feds were instantly there and all the info we could get is that bullet holes appeared in the building overnight. Wouldn't even confirm there was a shooter when there was. It's like a black hole. Also elaboration on Catman and a story. I don't green text so fuck off. Our story begins in the year 1999 when my uncle Bob, his wife and two children move from Union Gap to Tampico, Yakima, Washington. Nothing specific in the beginning was ever brought to any of our attention but it was known that the area was strange. I was pretty young at the time, eight, so there's not a lot I remember outside the event of which I'll speak. The event in which I speak is our dealing with what was dubbed Catman. There was an oasis up the road, around the corner and down some more. The oasis was surrounded by the thickest brush imaginable, to this day I've never seen anything like it. Cows would go missing, like the entire cow, and bits would appear around the pond as well as a great many other bones, bits of clothing etc. But these cow and horse parts would sometimes be as far as a mile and a half from their pastures. For those not aware, Cougars will only drag prey a few hundred meters tops before feasting and leaving what's left for predators. Anyhow, it had been long known that this area was evil. Illegals working the fields would go missing with no trace, and no search as to the nature of the non-existence in this country officially, for all I know those could have been rumors. Getting to the bread and butter. My older brother and our four cousins all heard about this thing and one night we decide to perform a community service and go kill this thing. My older cousins were about 16 on the average, so we were not granted permission to take any firearms, instead we bolted butcher knives to axe handles and made these spear things. I was pretty young and wanted to go so my uncle Bob came and brought a side arm as well. Like someone just said wandering about Tampico unarmed isn't advised. We walk out to this place, and as we approach the oasis there is this mass temp drop, I am talking like 20 degrees. About 20 meters before the fence surrounding the oasis and my uncle orders me to stay back. He allows the older ones to approach, I suppose he feels they can handle themselves. Gary, Jake and Thomas, the older three, cross the fence and approach the wall of thicket and jungle. 
I mean a linebacker couldn't tackle his way through, it would take several hours with a large saw to get into it. The other two, my brother and cousin Andy, stayed on the road. Right as the elder three got to the tree line, we heard what sounded like a tornado blowing through the trees. The wall of brush opened a gap eight feet tall by four feet wide or so. We had no lights so there was only shadow. My uncle shouted, run, and he picked me up and ran with me under his arm a mile back to the house. Before the elder three cousins broke and ran, Thomas and Jake threw their makeshift spears and stuck the thing. The rest is too much for me to explain thoroughly on my phone, but the long and short of it is Thomas and Gary cut back to the road and caught up with Trevor and Andy who eventually caught up with me and Uncle Bob. Jake took a straight right and cut through orchards and pastures with the thing hot on his heels. It followed him all the way back to the house. It stayed there on the hillside for a while and eventually came down to the house and was behind a shed. For all we know it could have been a bear. So for some backstory, I live less than a mile from an Indian reservation in Washington, but the first story happens to me when I was driving to my grandpa's that lives in a different part of Washington. Be me. Going to family reunion in late July. Family reunion is at grandpa house in middle of nowhere. On way to grandpa's house see woman pacing back and forth on the side of the road on a back road in the middle of the woods. Mom and I start laughing assuming it's just a meth head. She's old and wearing bright orange shirt. Be my mom. Driving home from my grandpa's so she can go to work next day while my brother and I sleep over at my grandpa's. Around 11 p.m. same day. See same women hiding behind tree on side of road. Two months later driving to my grandpa's again to visit. Driving down same back road joking about the crazy lady from last time. The same lady in the same clothing is standing there on the side of the road staring at us as we drive by. Get to grandpa's house and tell my uncle but he doesn't believe us. Drive back 10 minutes later and she's gone. Remember this road is in the middle of nowhere. Same day driving back from grandpa's house. Mom and I talking about hitting animals while driving. Five minutes after that conversation a deer jumps in front of the car and we almost hit it. Be me. Live like one half a mile away from an Indian reservation. It's like 3 a.m. in the winter. Be 17 at the time, so I went outside to smoke a cigarette. When I finished the cig I grabbed the handle to go back inside. Door was locked. Home alone shitting myself because my door was locked i'm in a hoodie and shorts and it's 14 degrees outside i didn't have my phone i live in woods so it is very very dark i walk around to the window of my room to try and climb through of course my window is locked hear something rustling in bushes behind me nope out of there and walk back to my porch then the light bulb on my front porch explodes literally explodes and pitch black with glass shards around me. Hear quiet male voice muttering. Can't understand it but it's getting louder. More voices around me. Try to open door again but still locked. Run back to room window. Break window and jump in. Sit in the bathroom with my 12 gauge for the rest of the night. Be me. 15 playing video games in middle of night. Hear someone walking on my porch. Loud heavy footsteps. Ears start ringing and my head starts to tingle. Earlier in day, I shot a buck in my backyard and it was in my garage. Hear noise in garage even though it was locked. Open door that connects my house to my garage and see the smaller door that leads to outside is snapped in half and buck is gone. Nope, 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 nope. Lock door. Tiptoe back to my room and decide to look out room window. At least five black figures standing out there. Nope, 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 nope. Hide in closet for rest of the night. Just call me Washington Anon. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. 
If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.